Okay. Our task that we started last time was to take our design and turn it into first a prototype, then an actual website. Um, so that's going to be the assumption of our start starting point is that we have the design documents almost done and we're working on the prototype. So we have the, the two documents that are probably most critical for this part are the skeleton and the structure chart. The skeleton being the chart that looks like this. Where you sketch out in very general terms, what the basic structure of the page is. Or you might have a header, a navigation, a footer, and a content area. That's what we mean by the skeleton portion of it. We don't necessarily define in, in great detail what's going to be contained in these, but we just sort of sketch it out. And again, the thing to keep in mind is that you may only have one of these for your entire site. If every page sort of follows the same pattern, you may have just one of these. You could have variations if there's something different about one particular page or a group of pages. Like maybe on, one, maybe on the home page, for example, the navigation doesn't go vertically, it goes horizontally or whatever. All right? Or there might be uh, a certain section of the page that maybe has another little side section that only appears on those sorts of pages, in which case you might have a couple of those. So for your project especially, I would think one or two. If, if you're tempted to create more than one or two, then, then maybe, maybe you're overthinking it. Um, um, or maybe you, you've, you've picked up too big of a project. So if you, if you have more than a couple of wireframes, um, you know, we, we can chat about it. So if I'm not mistaken, last time we had built the basic structure of the page and we were working on the individual pieces uh, of the page. So let me download that example from last time and we're going to continue. Our first goal, if you remember, is to build a prototype. And a prototype is, is meant to be a working model. It should look enough like the, the final thing that people can look at it and really get a good sense of what the final site is going to look like. But it doesn't have to be perfect yet. Which means things like maybe you don't have the actual photos that are going to appear on the final site. So maybe you just use a placeholder photo. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. The question was, is, is should uh, every image tag have an alt tag? And the question is absolutely. All right. bring down what we were working on last time. I swear the computer, even the computer seem like they work slower on a Monday morning. Maybe it's just my imagination. So here's where we were. We had our template file and we had a, a, a sort of a dummy image logo file. And if we look at this. All right. We were doing uh, a site for um, a, a fictional organization. Um, Zeller's photography, and uh, we said that that was my logo, the picture of the jellyfish, and then I have a couple of lines of text. And then we had sort of a content area that we use Greek text. Again, that's another example of what we might do in a prototype. If we don't have the exact verbiage that is going to be put on a page, we'll just put a placeholder text, and that's that, that's that dummy text, that, that Greek text. Um, at this point, we're really, we're, we're really literally just putting the content on the page. We're not really concerned at all about the formatting. Um, actually, when you start developing sites with an eye towards mobile, 
you will kind of take this strategy, uh, and they call it the mobile first strategy. You'll get the very bare bones of it working first before you add all the, all the fancy stuff. So at this point, we're just getting that. And I think if I'm going to look at what we have in the template, I think um, we have... the sections laid out, but we don't have anything in a few of the sections. And that, that is the case. That is what I remember. All right. So I have the header. I have sort of my dummy content. I then have the navigation and footer. Keep in mind that these things are going to be, or, or this is the one that's going to be different on each page. These, the header, the nav, and the footer are, are, are sections that are going to be common on each page. And I'm going to try to get that as right as I can. Because remember what my strategy is. I'm first going to make the template. I'm going to apply some CSS to it to get it looking the way I want to. And then I'm going to clone that template over and over and over again to, for each of the pages um, that, that we have. All right? So I have the banner. I have my placeholder section. If I remember right, my wireframe for this one actually looked a little different than the one I drew a second ago. It looked more like this. Banner content, navigation, and footer. All right. And I'm going to make sure that those are the sections on my page and that I get the common ones, which are these, as correct as possible. Now, for the navigation, I'm going to refer to my structure chart. And if you remember, I think I said that I'm going to have a home page, a uh, about us page, maybe a gallery page, given that we're a photographer, and then a contact us. So I'm going to go and create the navigation containing those links. And again, I'm going to be concerned first of all about the gain of content right. The appearance I, can come later. The appearance I can put in via the CSS uh, at, at a later point. So I'll go in and I will create in my nav section Navigation, typically, if you think of it, what is your navigation? It's a list of links. And since the order is not completely defined, uh, it doesn't have to be in that order. In other words, it's not like a ranking of, of things numerically. It's going to be an unordered list. So I'll create an unordered list, and I'll put a list item for each of my pages. And each list item will contain a link. Now I'm going to try to get the names of these right. Because, again, once I start to clone them, if I decide to go back and change or add a page or get rid of a page or change the name of the page or something like that, then I have to go back and change it on all the clones. So I'm going to try to get it in the template as, as right as I possibly can. All right. I'm calling my home page index.html. And that's a good practice because the way most web servers are, are, are configured, that is sort of the default for a website's home page. In other words, when you type in a URL, you're actually typing in a path to a file. All right? And the path to a file can end with a file name. All right? So if I go in and, like in this case, HTTP, s angel.lorainecc slash section slash default asp that's my file name that i'm pulling off of their server from the section folder on the angel website now you might say well i don't put file names on well yeah that's true you don't in all cases put file names on i can just go to angel.lorainecc.edu all right 
Well, notice it redirected me to that, so maybe that's a bad example. Let's type in Google. Oops. Notice I didn't put in a file name there. Well, typically the web server is configured to deliver some default file name. So if a file name is omitted, it knows what to give. And typically that default file name is index.html. That's sort of a good habit to get into, um, naming your home page uh, index.html. There's other possibilities as well, depending on the language that you're using. All right, but I'm going to go and I'm going to clone this. for my four different pages that I'm creating. Again, since this is a common content, I'm going to try my best to get it right. And I'm not necessarily worried at this point about the appearance of it. All right. Likewise, I'm going to have a footer that really just contains, you know, maybe some basic stuff. Maybe a link to my email address, whatever. Um, we'll just keep it at this, keep it simple. And so if we again go look, look at our template, we're looking at a page that looks very much like the first pages that we've done in this class. Because it's all content. All right? There's no styling done to it at all. So now we're going to go and we're going to apply some style to it. All right? And... We're going to use what's called the CSS block model, all right, in doing this. The CSS block model is a way of looking at, like, each of the main sections of the page, and even some of the, even the subsections going on down. But we talk about block tags in this class, and block tags are tags that start on a new line. So this mostly applies to block tags. Some of the aspects appear to, to inline tags as well, but this definitely applies to block tags. And that is we can treat this like a block on our page, and we can put attributes on it. So one thing I do when I'm first designing my page is even if I don't want colors in the final version, I'll put some colors on each of the blocks just so that I can see where they are. All right? So what I'm going to do is... I'm going to create my CSS file. And I'm going to start putting just some colors on my basic sections. That way I can keep an eye on where they are. And I suggest that this is a good debugging tool. In other words, if something isn't laying out the way that you think it is, Go and give it a color that's really going to stand out, you know, maybe very different than the, the rest of your color scheme. And in that way, it'll jump out at you, and, um, and, and, and you, you might be able to see what's going on. Now, in this case, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, we'll pretend that I'm a black, you know, I take mainly black and white uh, photos. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have it in shades of gray. So I'll make my header, give it a background color of... Um, a very light gray. I'll give my content a lighter still shade of gray. 
I'll give my nav a darker shade of gray. And I'll give my footer the darkest shade of gray yet. So I'm going to save this as. Make sure it's in the same folder as my other stuff. It isn't yet. So I'll go in there. And I'm going to make sure that my template is linked to that style sheet in the way that we've done before. So I'll go in here and say link type equals text slash CSS, rel equals style sheet. Ref equals style.css. And for good measure, I forgot the title tag the other day, so I'll put and I'm gonna put the word prototype in the title because I'm gonna have to change the title on every page anyhow, so I might as well remind myself of that. Alright, so now we have this. And if we look at our page again, we get these different blocks, all right? Now, notice that by default, a block tag extends the width of the screen, all right? Notice that the text is right up against that. Notice that there is a space between these elements. These are all attributes that you can control. Now remember that the way your page look the way your page looks ultimately depends on a combination of the defaults of the browser plus the code that you've put in for the CSS. So some of these things I haven't controlled yet there's certain default values. For example, there's a gap between these even though I didn't say there should be a gap, right? The reason is that there's some defaults built into the browser. So, what I can do is I can control all of these attributes but I don't have to control all of them. For example, I'm going to put a width on the, on the, on the banner. All right? I'm going to say the width of the banner. And how do I do that? Simply with the, the word width. Width. Uh, let's say 600 pixels. There we go. And the width doesn't extend the, the, the width of the screen. It just goes that far. All right. How does it know how tall to make it? Because I didn't specify a height. Default of the browser and yeah, the default of the browser. It makes it tall enough to fit the content that's in it, in other words. In other words, is this tall because that's how much space this stuff takes up. The, the image, the H1, and the H2. That's how much space that takes up. All right? Now, let's do some other things. Let's say if we want to put some space between the, 
end of the container and the text. That is done with the padding. So I can say padding 10 pixels. And if we look at this, notice how then the stuff doesn't go right up to the edge of it. There's like a little gap between the edge of the, the container and the text. Yes. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Some of these attributes you can specify a couple different ways. All right. If I simply say padding, I'm actually setting four different paddings. I'm setting the top padding, the left padding, or the right padding, the bottom padding, and the left padding. So if I just say padding, or, or in a minute there's going to be margin, and then in two minutes there's going to be border, they all work the same. I could specify padding dash right and specify just padding on the right. Or I could say padding dash left and just do the padding on the left. But if you wanted all four uh, directions, you can simply just say padding. All right. Um, we'll get into more of this. I'll, I'll, I'll give more examples of this going forward. Um, typically, that's what I do. That's the, the most straightforward. All right. We can put a border around this if we want. So I can say border, five pixel, solid, black. Here I'm actually giving three attributes to the border. And again, that's another kind of shortcut that we can use. I could specify the border width, the border style, and the border color. Or I can simply say border and put all of those in. So when we do that then, it looks like that. All right. Now one thing to keep in mind. As we keep adding these things on, it's adding to the total width of the block. In other words, if we look at the CSS code, I said that the block is 600 pixels, has 10 padding, and 5 pixel border. No, I just, I must have bumped the space bar. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Uh, it, it is funny. It, it, it does sometimes seem a little arbitrary when these things matter and when they don't. But generally speaking, an extra space like in the CSS doesn't matter, except for the times that it does <laughs> matter. All right. Okay. Uh, the width of this, the total width of this then, actually is the width of the block, that's 600, plus the width of the border, that's 5, on each side, plus the width of the padding. I forgot about the padding, which is 10 on each side. So actually, this div takes up three or 630 pixels going across. Because, again, the, the, the width of the content of that div is 600. We have a padding of 10 pixels on both sides. We have a border of 5 pixels on, on both sides. So there's a 5-pixel border. There's the 10-pixel padding. Here's the 600-pixel width. We got 10 more padding. And then 5 more border. All right. So that actually takes up 630 characters wide, or I'm not characters, pixels wide. All right? So keep in mind that it's not like those come out of the width. All right? And the reason that I, I take pains to point this out is back in the old days, some browsers mistakenly did take it out of the, the width, and that caused all sorts of problems. And we'll probably address that um, later on in the course. All right. What else can we specify? We can specify margins. And margins are the space in between things. So I can say margin 30 pixels. And that puts 
more space from the edge of it to there, from the top to there, and between these two things. Padding is the space between the edge and where the content starts. All right. Margin is the space between two different elements. So if I was going to draw that, we have our two divs here. This, there, this is the padding because it's the space between the edge of this and the content. This is the margin, which is the space between the two elements. This has some implications. In other words, the padding is in, gets the background color of the div, all right? Whereas the margin doesn't get the background color of the div, all right? The, mar the padding is within the border, is inside the border. The margin is outside the border. Now, one thing about margins is they don't necessarily add up, all right? And that could be confusing, but in a way it makes sense. So if I, for example, go and put in a margin here of 30 pixels, You might think there will be 60 pixels between the header and the section, right? A 30 pixel margin on the header, a 30 pixel margin for the section. Doesn't work that way, all right? And I'll try to explain why in a second here. So if I go and save that, the space between those two didn't change at all. In other words, that vertical margin between those two didn't change at all. The left margin on that guy changed because I gave him a margin, but the margin between those two didn't change at all. And why is that? The margin is how much space an element wants between it and its neighbors. So if both of those want 30 pixels between it and, it, and, and its neighbor, then 30 pixels is sufficient to satisfy both of their margins. You know, because the header is 30 pixels away from its neighbor, because, and that, that satisfies its 30 pixel margin. The section is 30 pixels away from its neighbor. So that is satisfied. So it doesn't necessarily add up the margins. All right? The margins sort of um, will accommodate the amount of space in between that. So if I were to change this to 40, It's going to make the margin between them 40 pixels and not 70 pixels. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So think of, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, being kind of a, a, an introvert, you know, and, and, you know, you know how people say they have a space around them. Like, it, it, you, know, you, you know, people feel uncomfortable if you violate, you know, if you get into their space. Think of the margin as like the space for that div. And as long as there's that much space between it and its neighbor, it's going to be happy. All right? Doesn't necessarily need to add up um, the, the spaces in between them. All right. Let's go in and give this guy a width. I'm actually going to change the width of this guy to a hundred. Uh, to no, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it at six hundred. I'm going to center it, though. Okay? Now, how do you center something? You center something by adjusting its margins. Okay? Because a margin is the space between things. So, what I can do is I can say margin, let's say 10px auto. Now, let's look at what that means. Remember I said how you can, you can put in margins either one margin covers all four directions, or you can put in individual margins. 
When I say 10 pixels auto for the margin, this is what I mean. It goes clockwise, so it goes like a clock. Ten pixels, auto. So we, the first margin relates to the top. The second margin relates to the right. So ten pixels, auto. Since I only have two, I don't have all four dimensions, it simply repeats again. So the bottom margin gets to be ten pixels, and the left margin gets to be auto. And auto margin effectively centers it within the page. So if I change the margin of this guy to 10 pixels auto, what that's going to do is that's going to put 10 pixels on the top, 10 pixels on the bottom, at least. All right. And then it'll set an automatic margin on the side of those. So that gets centered then. All right. Now, I could, well, we'll leave it at that for now. We'll leave it at that for now. I don't want my section to be extending all the way across, so I'll give it a width, too. I'll say width. Four hundred pixels. Then I'll add some padding on it. And that's what we'll leave. So now we have that. Notice how we are slowly moving towards our end goal, which is the wireframe that looks like this. Banner, content, navigation, footer. We kind of almost have this much going on. We just have to work on those two guys. All right. Now, I know what people typically say about the links when they do it this way, when they put it in an ordered list. They say, I hate the bullet points. I don't want bullet points in my navigation. That looks goofy. Well, there's a lot of things that we can do to style the links. All right. And we're going to take uh, some time to, to uh, investigate that uh, more thoroughly now, because now is where we can make our navigation really look good. All right? So first thing we want to do is we want to get rid of the bullet points. Second thing, if you notice, the blue, I guess I can read the blue against that, but that might not be the best color uh, to have for that. I want these links to really stand out. Remember, a navigation is an important aspect of a web page. So therefore, um, you know, uh, the more I can do uh, with the navigation to make it stand out and make it apparent that these are the links, the, the better off I'm going to be. That's one drawback that a lot of people have in the assignments they've turned in so far, is they've styled it to make the text look good against the background, but the links still are hard, very hard to read because Again, remember that there's defaults built into the browser for links. And typically, the default for a browser is that the link is going to be blue and underlined. So that may work on a white background, but if you put it against a green background or a, a dark gray background or a black background or whatever, it's not going to be very effective. So what I want to be able to do is I want to put in some style rules here 
that will make the links look more like we want them to look. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to specify nav ul list style type none. What do you suppose that is going to do? Uh, uh, close. I think I heard over here. It'll get rid of the bullet points. So it won't get rid of all the style. In other words, if I had other attributes, it would get it. But it's going to get rid of the bullet, bu the bullet points. So if I go and look at that, notice those bullet points are gone. All right, which is which is nifty. All right, let's read. And let's make sure we understand this, because I'm not sure if I, we, we've had a selector like this in class before. Notice that this isn't one HTML tag, but it's two HTML tags. It's nav ul. All right. What does that mean? Well, that means any ul that's within the navigation section gets the style rule. So we can really fine tune those selectors all right, to really point to specific elements. We might have a list in the body of our page that we want to have bullet points for, right? Because it's a bulleted list. But for the navigation, that really doesn't look right, so we get rid of them. But just on the list within the navigation section. Now, here's where if you've done some web development before and you're used to using divs, all right, for everything, prior to HTML5, um, there was no nav and section and header and all that, you, you used essentially a div tag for all those and you gave some unique IDs. All right. This is where we have less of a need to use IDs than we have before in the past. Because in the past, we'd put an ID on a div and then I'd say everything within the ID of nav that's an unordered list have no style type. Now we can really pinpoint and say any nav section of this page a UL doesn't have any style. Now, how did I know that its list style type is none? Because I've given this lecture like a, a thousand times. All right? I don't expect you to have all these things memorized. But what I do hope for you is that over time you develop a sense of kind of like where you're going to look. All right? First of all, right off the bat, it should be a tip off to you that this is something that's controlled by CSS because it's the way that it looks, all right? It's a list, but it's a list without dots in front of it. You're not changing the, the content there. It's still a list of items, all right? All the items are the same. The only difference being is that there's no dots in front of it, okay? So it's, it's, it's purely a cosmetic thing. It's purely the way it looks. Therefore, it's something that's controlled by CSS as opposed to HTML. What you can do then is look and see and again, a number of good resources. Go to, to this one, which has a lot of nice features to it. And we can look up styling lists. And we can look, and you can see that the list style type, we have a lot of possibilities of what we can do. Oh. And here's all the properties that we can put on. We can put a circle, put a disk, or we can simply put none which is what we have here. Now, you might think, you know, every teacher says you might think you know that what he's going to say is, is not the case, right? You might think I could do something like this, and I could say, give me the text color of white on these links.
That didn't change it. That didn't change the text color. Why didn't it? Well, because links have their own defaults in the browser. So if I specify a style rule on a UL, or even if I specify the style rule on the LI, that doesn't apply. All right, because the browser's style rules for links take precedence over that. What I can do, though, is I can put in any link within the nav section I want to look a certain way. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, well, two things are responsible. Actually, that's, part of that is browser behavior. The other part of that is um, in the style rules. We'll, we'll see how we can do that uh, uh, in a second here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assign just a color for the links here, but a color for them all the time. So I'm just going to set one color at this point, so, which is um, a color of white. All right, so now those links are white. All right. I can get rid of the underline if I want to. You, go ahead. What does the A mean? Well, what does the A mean? Well, how do we read this selector? Nav A. All right. Any, anything in the, any A tag, which is a link tag or anchor tag, within the nav section. So remember that in our nav tag, our links are in an A tag, so the anchor tag. All right? No. You can't, you can't just make up tags, right? That's the name of a tag. So the link tag is an A tag. So it has to be like one of the actual tags that's used. If you want to make something up for a special purpose, you can do that with a class or you can do that with an ID. But you, but you can't do it with HTML tags because the browser won't know how to treat then those HTML tags. All right. Again, we want the navigation to be very prominent. So what we might do is we might actually make the font bigger on those links. And we can do that by saying font size 1.5 M. And again, an M stands for emphasis. So 1.5 M means emphasized 1.5 times more than it normally should be. So if we go and look at this, there, we made them bigger. Now we can have all kinds of fun with this if we want to. We can get rid of the underline. Decoration. None. No underline there. We can give a background color on it. Adding on them. Much padding on that. Probably too much. Now, then we can have all sorts of fun with, like the question asked, uh, how can I designate visited links looking differently? 
Or how can I designate when the mouse hovers over a link to get it to behave differently? These are all called pseudo classes, all right? And what we can do is something like this. I can say nav a hover. And I'm just going to flip the colors. In other words, uh, originally the background's black, the text is white. I'm going to flip the colors so that the color will be black and the background will be white. So now, as I put my mouse over that, I get the effect like that. Where it gives the user a visual cue that, hey, that's a link, all right? Remember, we want to make it very obvious that our links are links, all right? So one way we can do that is we can use different background colors and, and give some behavior for a hover. I'm going to go and I'm going to add a link to for Google to my list, simply so I can show a visited uh, link. All right. I'm also going to great question. Let's come back to that in a second. All right. In fact, let's do it now. All right. What if I want these links not to be oriented vertically, but I want them to be oriented horizontally? The question was, is it no longer an unordered list? What do you think? Is it no longer an unordered list then? Okay. I'm going to disagree. It's still a list. It's just a list that's going horizontal. You know? I can write my grocery list. Say I want bread, seltzer, crackers, cheese. It's still a list if I write bread, crackers, whatever I said, whatever I said. All right? It's just oriented differently. All right? And the way that you change the orientation of a tag is with the display attribute. And there's a couple different display attributes that we're going to look at now. One of them is block. One of them is inline. There's also an inline block, which is sort of a hybrid of the two. And there's also none, which mean, makes it uh, invisible. All right? Um, and we'll talk about when you'd want to do that later on in the course. But if I want to ho orient these horizontally, I can simply say those LIs, which are normally block tags, I can change the default on that. and make those, pardon me? Oh, thanks. And then those are oriented horizontally. Pardon me? Yes. The, and, and that's an important concept because again, you really have to get used to the mentality of, I'm going to create the HTML to represent what this content is. I have a list of links here, so it's going to be in a list tag. But well, I don't want bullet points, and I want it to be horizontal. doesn't matter. That's the way the list looks. And the way that something looks is controlled by CSS. Now, the other thing we can do uh, along these lines, in addition to the hover, is we can put some designation that the link has been visited. So in this case, I'll make it so that if the link is visited, I'll make the text color yellow. So let me go and add a link to Google here. Just so that we can demonstrate this. No 
notice how Google has yellow text on it because I visited Google sometime today. All right, on this. Now, the thing I want to emphasize is, notice how we are prefixing all of these style rules with an NA. What that means is we're not doing every link. We're not doing every UL. We're not doing every LI. We're doing those that are in the nav section only. So that gives us control to make things within a section look a certain way. We might not want, again, every list to go horizontally. We might have in our content a plain old ordered list that look, we want to look like an unordered list. Or we might have links that we don't want the mouse over to work that way. That's fine. These style rules only apply to those things that are in the nav section. So we've refined our selectors to where we're not saying everything, but we're saying some of the things. Um, you know, only, only you know, links in that section or in that section. So we're really fine-tuning it. Okay, the question is, all right, how do we get this to be alongside that. And there's a bunch of ways that we can do that. Oh, yeah, to get this to line up with that, yeah, I'd just adjust the margin. Uh, I'd, probably, I'd probably put all of this in a container div and then center the container div and, and all that. All right, but yeah, I, effectively I would, I would adjust the margin. All right. Yes because that's a grouping of, of everything uh, in there. That's kind of a little cheat, but we won't tell anyone. I'll turn the microphone off, you know, when, when I do that so I don't get, they don't get me on tape. All right, but yeah, it's a little, a little bit of a cheat because you're adding an HTML element, but really it isn't because it's a way of grouping all your content together um, to, to handle it a certain way. We'll get to more of that next time, all right? And we'll continue on the block model with this. All right. Okay, we'll see you up in lab.